Stephen Stainer, the Stainer family, Timothy White, and the White family all suffered at the hands of Kenneth Parnell, and just when they began to get their lives together, they would have to continue to relive the kidnappings through two trials. This would be difficult for anyone, but the legal issues involved in each case would also drag things out and call into question basic legal principles surrounding kidnapping and sexual abuse. In this episode of The Life and Kidnapping of Stephen Steiner, we cover the difficult legal issues involved in convicting a man for such terrible crimes in part 8 of our series, The Law. Welcome to California True Crime. I'm your host for these series of episodes on Stephen Stainer, and with me are Sean and Charles. How are you guys? I'm doing very well, thank you. I'm doing good. It's just a little hot in here. Yeah. So the last two episodes, we covered the time period between when Stephen and Timothy escape and the trials start. And in reality, there's, as we said, so much stuff happening, so we just sort of focused on their lives. Tonight, we're going to be focusing more on what happens, specifically just the legal stuff and what's going on with the trials. So just to give everyone kind of an update on where uh, the people and our defendants in the case are, when we when Stephen and Timothy are found, Kenneth Parnell is basically immediately arrested, and he's been in jail this entire time. Uh, during the week after their the boys come home, they also find Murphy, and pretty quickly after that, they find Porman. So everyone is under arrest when we start this episode. And that's within a week. The, the finding Murphy was just in a couple of days. It took a lot, a little longer to find Porman, and we don't know exactly how that happened. If he came forward, or if the police found him, because he's a juvenile and they're trying to keep most of that under wraps. But that's still pretty impressive. For, I mean, by the time you know day one, the boys walk into the the um, police station, and Stephen turns in Timothy, and seven days later, they've they've found the kidnapper and two of the accomplices. In a case that has been, for Stephen, seven years old. And a lot of that is due to the fact that Stephen remembers a lot from when he was kidnapped. That's the most remarkable thing. I won't say the most remarkable thing. It's all a remarkable story. But that idea that Stephen, as a little kid, remembers so much. And really vivid, accurate detail that helps investigators later. I think it's it's amazing. Well, and Timothy too, right? I mean, there's a lot of times in the story where Timothy's had to correct the adults because he remembers certain things. The other thing for everyone to keep in mind as we go through this is that last episode, we talked a little bit about the history of sex abuse just in the United States and in California and sort of where people are at with understanding that. And that's important to sort of understand as we begin to talk about legal issues because there were a lot of surprising things for me. So just kind of keep that in the back of your mind. On March 2nd, 1980, after Stephen and Timothy escape from the Manchester ranch, they eventually make their way to the police station in Ukiah. There they tell police that they've both been kidnapped, and a little after midnight on March 3rd, 1980, which is a Sunday, the Ukiah police go to the Palace Hotel where Parnell is at work and arrest him. Parnell does not talk with police and asks for a lawyer, and he's charged only with the kidnapping of Timothy White. Initially, he's held on $7,000 bail, which in today's money is about $22,000. A hold is also put on him, uh, on Parnell, by the Merced police. And this hold basically means that if, for some reason, Parnell were to make bail or to get out of jail, that he would immediately be rearrested and brought down to Merced. So I'm not, I'm not too keen on really how bail works. So if it's $7,000, I know you're supposed to put up something, but do you still pay it? I, I really don't know. Do you? Does anyone know how bail works? So if Parnell wanted to make bail, if he was going to pay that, he has a few choices. At least you do now. I assume it sort of worked the same way. He could go in and if you pay cash or a cashier's check or if someone did for him, he'd have to pay the full amount. And then once he went to trial, as long as he showed up to all his um, all the things that they had, he would get that money back. But it's the full amount. If he, and some places take credit cards now, just in case someone's wondering, if he uses a bail bondsman, they put up the money for him, but they charge him 10% up front. 
So, and he will not get that back. Okay. The bail bondsman gets back their full money if he makes all of his dates, but he, they keep the amount of money that okay. he gives them. So the 10% is like a handling fee. Like I'm doing all this work. I'm going to this. You're st- in this case, you're still going to owe me 10%. Of, yeah. They have to give them that. In you're going to owe me 700 to bucks to getting, for getting you out of prison. You can also put jail. up um, like at your house. But your house has to be more than, I think it's twice. More than $7,000. Yeah, it has to be twice at least what bail okay. is, I believe. But that's sort of how it works. And Parnell doesn't have, he's not known to have a lot of money. That's not his situation. So. And then going back to the, to the property or, or something you're putting up for collateral, then if Parnell doesn't make it to court, whoever put up the car or the house or whatever, is is the entire thing seized? Or Yes. I, okay. You have an, like, I believe it's a lien on your property or whatever it is for the for mm-hmm. for the amount of the bail. No, I think it's the whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah. So if you if I but have I, a bail of seven thousand dollars, my house is worth say fifty thousand dollars. You don't show up to court, then I'm out my house. Yeah, I mean because they can't get money a certain just amount from your house. They have to sell your house to right, get even that right. tiny amount. So yeah, you're putting your whole house on the line. So right at the beginning of all of these legal issues, there's confusion over who will bring charges against Parnell in the kidnapping case of Stephen. On the first day they're found, the district attorney in Ukiah says that he believes any charges that have to be brought in that specific case will have to be brought by them. And the biggest issue here is that the charge of kidnapping, when not done for murder or ransom, had in 1980 a three-year statute of limitation, and Stephen had been by... By this time, he had been with Parnell for seven years, which means those three years had passed them by. However, the Merced police from day one fully intend to arrest Parnell and bring him to trial. But this idea of Stephen's kidnapping being an easy case to wrap up is not in reality. And we're going to put this question aside for right now and talk about the other legal issues that come up before this. And this will sort of affect Timmy White's case too. So just kind of keep it in the back of your head. As we said, Parnell is being held in Ukiah, and on March 4, 1980, he's brought to the courthouse, which is a half a block from the Palace Hotel. Parnell is given a public defender named Scott Lestrange, and he pleads not guilty. Charges are also added against Parnell. Not only is he being charged with kidnapping, but also child stealing. And there are several varying reasons for this in the White case, but Parnell will be charged with both of these things initially in both Timothy White and the Stephen Steiner case once he finally is get, gets down to Merced. Could you explain the difference between child stealing and kidnapping? Because those seem like the same thing. Yeah, kidnapping is a crime committed against the person that you're actually taking. So in this case, the crime is actually committed against Timothy White by Parnell. Um, It has a three-year statute of limitation, and it's also defined by the use of force, which we'll get into. Uh, Child stealing is a crime committed against, usually for kids, it's committed against the parents, so the people who are um, in charge of the child. So then, so then, really, the victim of the child child stealing is the Stainers and the Whites. Right. The issue with child stealing, though, is it's most often used in cases when we talked about the most common kind of kidnapping, which is parents taking their own child or in custody cases. It can rise to being a felony depending on how it's done, but most often it's just a misdemeanor. So it's really a lesser charge, and it usually only has about a year or so jail time. So this is something they charge him with because they are very worried that in this case, they might not be able to prove that force was used when he kidnapped Timothy. And that if they can't prove that, this charge will get thrown out of kidnapping, which is the more serious charge. And they want to have something there that they can charge him with. And again, this is 1980. So when they they're talking about force, they're specifically talking about physical. Like I I I picked a child up, or in this case, I covered his head. I forced him in something. It's it's I laid my hands on that child. Yeah, this will be an issue in Stephen's case as well, and it will actually go to the California Supreme Court. Uh, both the statute of limitations and what and a question about what force is. Mm-hmm. Psychological force has been used in several other cases, and that's what they'll use for. Stephen's case in particular, Timothy, we know force was used. Sean Poorman picked him up, forced him into the back of the car. But police and the DA are also worried that in a courtroom, a jury might be more apt to believe an adult than they are two kids, including one of the children who will testify, Sean Poorman, who has committed crimes. Which, again, as we said earlier in this episode, the the memories of the two 
two children, in this case, Timothy saying, I was forced into the car, that, that becomes a way bigger deal then because that's an eyewitness account. Right. He experienced it. Sean Poorman did it. Both of them will say that. But there are, in plenty of cases, um, juries sometimes, or just people in general, will sometimes believe adults more than they will will kids. And they want to make sure that if for some reason, if they don't believe the children, or if for some other reason it gets thrown out, they have something they can charge Parnell with. Like a backup. Right. The other charge that will get... um, that Parnell will be charged with at some times and then kind of go away is false imprisonment. It's another lesser charge, usually a misdemeanor. Um, It's when you keep someone, it's kind of just what it says, falsely. And it can happen in, I don't know, in fights, like couples fighting and someone wants to leave and someone stands in front of the door. You're not really kidnapping someone, but you're keeping them from leaving. So it's a lesser charge. It carries with it a lesser penalty, but it is something they think that if nothing else sticks... You know, obviously, this Parnell is very dangerous, and that seems clear to everybody. And they want to be able to charge him and make sure that whatever he's charged with, he's something he's going he's going to get convicted of at least then to get him in the system. Right. But the the biggest goal is charging him with what he actually did, which is kidnapping. Right. At the arraignment, Parnell's bail is also increased from seven thousand to twenty thousand dollars, and a date for the preliminary hearing is set. This hearing starts on March 13th, 1980, and only lasts about an hour before legal issues come up. In fact, the only testimony that was given that day was by Jim White, Timothy White's father. For the preliminary hearing, Parnell is brought from the Ukiah Courthouse holding cell, where he had been since his arrest, and was wearing jailhouse blues and flip-flops. One of the first things that Parnell's lawyer does in the preliminary hearing, and this sets off one of the case's first legal challenges, is he requests that the hearing be closed entirely to the press and public. Scott Lestrange, Parnell's defense attorney, uses a law in California that was passed in 1872 and is found in Penal Code Section 868 and says that if any defendant asks for a hearing be closed to the public, then it is done so automatically. Under this law, all preliminary hearings in California are open to the public and press, unless there are issues with a right to a fair trial. And as it was written in 1872, all a defendant needs to do is just ask for a hearing to be closed, and then it gets closed. If closed, the only people allowed in the courtroom are the judge, bailiff, the prosecutor, the defendant and their lawyer, and in some cases the family of the defendant or the family of the people who the crime happened to, unless they would be called to testify themselves. People in the courtroom are also not allowed to discuss what happens during the hearing. After the judge granted this motion and ordered the court be closed to the public, United Press International, or UPI, immediately files an appeal to this motion. Their argument, and we'll go over both, is that closing the court to the press violates their First Amendment rights and the rights of a free press. The judge postpones the hearing so that everyone can file briefs and make their arguments. This is also not the first time this has come up in a courtroom. In fact, by the Stainer case, there had been six other cases where the trial courts, during just 1979 and 1980, had found Penal Code 868 unconstitutional. And there had also been a handful of cases that had been upheld as well. So this is a larger issue in California. There are, when I'm looking, when I was doing the research for this, there are a lot of cases which are being appealed for this issue. Um, So we're going to go through both the arguments and kind of talk about it. So we're going to go over both arguments. But first, a preliminary hearing is the first hearing held before a trial. We've talked about it in a couple of other episodes, and it's the hearing where the prosecution leads the hearing. There isn't a jury, and witnesses are called, and evidence is presented. A judge decides that there is or isn't enough evidence to proceed to trial and to continue to hold someone for the crime, in this case, Parnell. Is there any difference between a grand jury? I, I, it sounds a lot like a grand jury. Some of the rules sound kind of the same. I mean, I'm, we're, the three of us are not lawyers, so this is all just research we've done. Um, so I can see why you would say that. Uh, I do believe the defense gets to ask some questions, but there isn't. they don't present a defense. Okay. This is just, you're holding someone in jail. Is there a really good reason for us to be doing that? Let's make sure. And this happens before, unless the defendant waives it, before every California trial. Okay. For this argument, I also think it's important to understand that as we talk about this case, and this is true of all the cases we've covered and discussed on this podcast, but we're usually telling a story from a certain perspective. Most of this podcast has been us telling a story from, you know, Stephen Steiner's perspective or Timothy White's perspective. But for trial, the prosecution isn't necessarily representing um, Timothy White or Stephen Steiner. They're representing us, the state 
who's bringing a case against Pen- Kenneth Parnell. And I think for me, that sort of changes things when I think about these two arguments. So UPI's argument is that in California, as we discussed before, the right of the press is even more protected than, the, than that of the U.S. Constitution. Article 1, Section 2, Part A of the California State Constitution says, Every person may freely speak, write, and publish his or her sentiments on all subjects, being responsible for the abuse of this right. A law may not restrain or abridge liberty of speech or press. Of importance to UPI's case is their belief that the public has a right to these details, as it is the public holding Parnell. This is our chance to hear testimony, to understand and trust that the criminal court has reason to hold someone, and that ultimately the public has a right to know how a case is being handled and the underlying facts. Secrecy breeds distrust, and in a system where there are misdeeds that happen in front of everyone, holding hearings and criminal proceedings behind closed doors might magnify these inequalities. UPI also argues that the things they report on are important, but not just telling the simple facts or even interviewing witnesses themselves. That's not the same as having a reporter in court who can tell you how someone looks or sounds, their tone of voice, that sort of thing. Parnell's lawyer, Scott Lestrange, and the California Public Defender's Office, on the other hand, believe that in a case like this one, information from a preliminary hearing in which they can't mount a defense, it's just the prosecutor giving evidence, could unfairly prejudice people against their client. Basically, it's two fundamental rights at play here, and how the court system balances those. The other issue of interest here is one that is more procedural. The right of an open trial had been one that in California law was protected. What made this different was that this was a preliminary hearing, and judges had ruled differently regarding whether or not the right of the press was protected, specifically in a prelim hearing under the law. After hearing those two, I feel like, with it being the preliminary, I can kind of side with the defense, and it seems like they should, no matter what the case, should always say, oh, I want to close. And if that's how the law was written, it it just seems like it should happen because the more that gets out when they don't get to tell their side of the story would get skewed in the papers knowing that how reporters do it. And it would, for me, seem to cause a f- unfair trial. I, I don't know. I, I might see the argument uh, that I can see it a time period. I agree with you on that. If the public perception of your client walking in the door is already starting to be negative, then I, I'm, a, I'm with you. I, I'd move to have it closed, but if I'm the defendant in the case and the narrative I'm trying to spin is it's the state against me and I'm the little guy, I would think I'd want the press in there. I want to get my story out. I, it's like the David and Goliath thing. Like, look at the big, big bad state that's oppressing me and they're coming after me and I'm just, if I can get my story out in front, I might want to get the press on my on my side early. But this problem is with the preliminary, the the defendant doesn't get his story out until after the preliminary. Unless, right, and I agree, I, and I understand that. I'm what I guess what I'm trying to say is then, depending on what happened leading up to that, if I've been able to be an inter- interviewed, I'm thinking like um, cases where I'm um, thinking of like a, a, a case that you're going to be covering the Carrie Stanner case, the inter- the news re- the news reporter that interviews Carrie while he's in custody before anything happens. Um, not that specific case, but in that case where a news reporter gets gets a hold of a, a, a um, someone who's arrested and interviews ahead of time, if that makes sense, yeah, I can see maybe in that case trying to get your story out and and spin it in where you become the sympathetic person. Depending, obviously, there's nothing sympathetic about Parnell, but I'm I'm not using him as that example, right? Because this will affect, in theory, everyone who wants to have their preliminary hearing closed or not their decisions eventually will affect that right because then that sets up precedent moving down the line right and i think i don't i don't know how i feel about it because i do think they're both really important rights and i do think there are things there are cases at this time that i saw on the paper one in particular was five politicians who had been um well they were arrested and charged with taking money from the from the county they were in and um, siphoning it and that kind of thing and they wanted their preliminary hearing closed and UPI and that's in a different case said well they're trying to hide what they did from the public oh. we have a right to know what's going on and that I understood a little more even though I mean I do understand the fair trial stuff well yeah and that that crime in that case is that's directly against the state in general. I mean, if these are politicians that are working for the state in large, 
yeah, I can see where that that would be a hard one to to side with the defendants. And I guess you always kind of assume that the defense has a good reason for wanting it closed. But just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen a case out of Florida, a pretty big case dealing with um, human trafficking, where the defense and the prosecution work together to get sort of a sweetheart deal for a big time human trafficker. That's and right. they kept that illegally kept it quiet. But I mean, there are times where I, I, you'd like to trust your attorney. But I don't know, maybe but they're actually working in your best interest and not. Well, and then that in that story, you're hoping that the prosecution is working in the best interest of the people of your state rather than working behind the scenes with the defense attorney. Because, well, allegedly that this particular person has very powerful friends. Right. But I think in this case, we can see. There's been so much media attention and so much coming out about Parnell. And Mendocino is not a very big county, and that's theoretically where the jury is going to come from, that protecting that is also important. Would you also, I think you've read more than than either Sean or I on this, did you get the feeling that it was also done as a stalling tactic? Like, if if we go to this argument, then I have a few more weeks to put together a case, or I have, I mean, it could be no, months. No, I, I didn't get that sense. No. I mean, I, I don't know what was going on in this person's head, but when Parnell ends up in Merced, finally, and gets arraigned there, they ask for the same thing. So I think, and there are a lot of cases, like I said, in the paper where this is going, where this is something that's going for a lot of, you know, for a lot of people. So I think it's just something they really want done. Oh, and you touched on, Sean, the idea of, like, well, why wouldn't any, your defense attorney, that's... Move number one, let's... Yeah, the less people know, the better it seems for them. And eventually, actually, the first district court of appeals gets this case, and it can take months to get a hearing from them. Both sides are hoping they'll move this case to the top because of the urgency and because Parnell is in jail waiting. Kenneth Parnell has to agree to waive his right to a speedy trial in order to continue to pursue all of these legal issues. UPI will lose the appeal in appellate court, but no reasons or opinions are issued. So the preliminary hearing remains closed. UPI does appeal to the state Supreme Court, but they decline to hear the case. And this kind of goes on until 1986. Not this specific case, but this legal question. In 1986, in a U.S. Supreme Court decision, in a case out of California called Press Enterprise 2, the court ruled in a 7-2 decision that the court must have a high standard for closing a preliminary hearing. This was considered a win for the press. A defendant doesn't have the right to have a preliminary hearing closed without a reason, a reasonable belief that preliminary hearing coverage would hurt their Sixth Amendment right to an impartial trial. Secondly, the court also held that closure should only happen if every ability to find alternatives to closing the hearing had been accomplished. For instance, closing parts of the hearing as opposed to the entire thing. So if in this case, Timothy White was going to testify, uh, maybe you wouldn't want that part out because it might prejudice people you know, who see a little kid and they might feel things towards him and they might dislike Parnell more. Stuff like that. They might keep that part in private, but the rest of it could be out. Well, I also think how it's written with the wording that it's using, uh, higher standards or reasonable belief, I think that's what you said. Those, It's still just so broad, and it's a giant spectrum of what could be reasonable belief or high standard, where it seems like it would just take another long—it's like a whole other case all yeah. the time to just see if this case will be closed. What classifies as a reason yeah. to close it. Well, for other cases, I think they'll use some of the similar metrics here. I mean, this Parnell case is hu is huge; it's being covered all across the world, really. So, in that kind of case, you might need you know there's already so much media attention, there's already so much information out. You might need to, to the judge who will ultimately decide on whether or not something needs to be closed might look at that as a reason to to close put, it, put a lid on it, and, as a, and, yeah, or in the or in the public, in the case that you talked about about the politician, the crooked politicians. That's something that a reasonable person, a judge, might say, no, that's that's important for the public at large to understand what's going on and for full transparency to make sure that they know that these politicians aren't being affected or not affecting my judgment as a judge. I want that open. Yeah, because, like, I mean, in I can understand the spectrum where if it was, like, a purse snatcher, a first-time purse snatcher, and the defense tries to close it, that doesn't make any sense. But it's still, even on these giant cases, using words, high standards, and reasonable belief, it's it, it still leaves it way too open, I feel like. It would yeah. be interesting to see how many, like how how much opposition to some of those cases. 
Like, is this something that the is vigor like the prosecution? Are they vigorously defending their right to have it open, or is it in some of these cases it's like, yeah, we're we're good with it, you know? But maybe since I haven't followed many, I've never really heard about them no. trying to close it. Like, yeah. you know. In this case, it does have a different impact on the family as well, aside from just the legal issues, because um, this takes so long to get worked out. There are different preliminary hearings started and only to be closed down again when there are more appeals. And so I just want to think about the Stainer family who are going back and forth from Ukiah to Merced, because Stephen is a major part of this case. He's a huge witness. And so he's believed to be testifying in both the prelim hearing as well as later. And so getting this all worked out, they make dates, you're supposed to be there, they show up, and then, you know, there are appeals. And those are important, I think, legal questions that have to be worked out. But this is a kid who's trying to get his life back and go back to school, and it's just constantly interrupted. So if you're keeping score, by this point, not only has he been kidnapped and abused for seven years, he's had his life splashed all over um, the media. He's had... You know, and and both hailed as a hero and then had private things publicly. He's had his life uprooted multiple times, on top of which he's getting jerked back and forth for this preliminary hearing. I, it, again, it's another instance of these both of these families yeah, not and, being allowed time to heal. And, and, and it's just a good reminder that if something like this happens, maybe in your community, you just remember that. Think about those things. That that his can, life right, and that yeah. continue, continue, continuing victimization. The preliminary hearing proceeds on April 14th, 1980 in Ukiah, and it was close to the public and the press. Timothy testified, as did Stephen, Delbert Steiner, Merced Police Officer Patrick Lumley, Leslie Stornetta, Sean Porman, and others. And all it lasts about an afternoon. Just as a reminder, Sean Porman had been arrested and his case is happening in juvenile court. Those hearings are close to the public, so not too much information gets out about what's happening to Borman. Quickly, he decides to help the defense and will testify against Parnell in trial. He's released to a group home in Redwood City that deals with children who have behavior issues. According to the terms of his release, he has to go to school, but he isn't really free, though. He has to always be there, and he can't leave until a judge decides. The judge in the preliminary hearing agrees with the prosecution that there is enough evidence to hold Parnell for trial in the kidnapping of Timothy White. The other legal issue that came up right away was the issue of the gag order. We've talked a bit about this in our other episodes, but the judge issued a gag order to the defense and the prosecution because he wants to protect Parnell's constitutional right to a fair trial, and there's a worry that leaking information could affect that. There will be a few issues with the gag order, but eventually both sides agree not to make any statements to the press without first agreeing on what it will say. So I know we've talked about gag orders before, so it's only the defense and prosecution now. So if the news asked the police, they'd be able to or not? I don't believe the police would be able to say anything okay. either in this case specifically. Uh, information does continue to flow, however, about Parnell, and most of that comes from other sources. We've talked about most of those. The gag order does not apply to the media, so gag orders can be issued against the media, but they often don't stand up to legal scrutiny because of the First Amendment. Also, this gag order does not apply to the case in Merced or the people involved there. So for Stephen's case, there's people can just talk directly to the press, although they're, in Merced they're being kind of tight-lipped. So in Ukiah, they're moving forward with a trial. Eventually, the transcript of the preliminary hearing is released to the public after the hearing is over. And while all this is going on in Ukiah, Merced police are working their case and continually asking if Parnell can be brought to Merced for arraignment on the charges there, which is understandable. They want their turn to finally arrest him. Mendocino County is reluctant to send Parnell down to be arraigned in Merced because once he's transferred out of their custody, they no longer have a say over him. Right now, he's in Ukiah. He's moving forward to trial. But if he goes to Merced and before a judge, that person could override this and keep him in Merced County. And this is not a dramatic thing like on TV where police aren't getting along. It's just that once he leaves Ukiah custody, a judge in Merced could decide, for instance, to keep him there and send him to trial. And then they will lose their chance to go to trial first. And both of these people, they want to put Parnell in jail and they want him to answer for both of the terrible crimes they've committed. On March 27, 1980, Parnell is finally in Merced. Mendocino County lets Parnell go to Merced after the DA there is able to get assurances from a judge that he'll be sent back to Ukiah in two days, which is just the beginning of one of the other big issues to the next couple of years, and that's one of money. 
This one's hard to discuss. And that's not because I don't think these trials are important and the money needs to be spent. But depending on where you live, even in California, money can be a big issue for justice, both for its fairness and in reaching it. And both Merced County and Mendocino County are all on the hook for these expenses. Parnell, for instance, he arrives in Merced on Wednesday, March 27th, 1980, by plane. It's a 250-mile trip, and he arrives by plane because they have to get the arraignment done, on, and they have to give him a public defender, and then he has to be back in Ukiah by Friday. And all of that is paid for by Merced County. And it's just one example of all the money that will be spent in these trials, but I'll, I'll try to point that out when I can. So Ukiah doesn't have any, they don't have to give any expense, even though they need to fly him back? It, they just, might have chipped in for some of it because of that reason. I, I don't know the exact details who pays for what. But. We've talked about this before when we, when we covered the Dorothea Puente case. Because Dorothea Puente's trial was moved to Monterey County, Sacramento County still had to pay the bill. So anytime something's moved, it's, it's who's who the case is being brought to has to foot the bill. So if you transfer uh, custody of your prisoner to Men- to from Mendocino to Men- Merced, then Merced's on the hook. Effectively, I believe then you would be you don't have to pay for that portion of it. Okay. But if you were if you're still prosecuting him just in a different venue or your cases are tied to that, then you're on the hook. Then you're on the hook for it, all of it or even a portion of it. Hey listeners, my name is Krista and I host a narrative true crime podcast called The Dark Divide. I've always been interested in the events and circumstances which shape a seemingly ordinary life into something made out of our worst nightmares. And now I get to take you along through the depths of obsessive research and my need to explore the unknown. So I invite you to come stare into the abyss with me. You can listen on iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and wherever else you enjoy your favorite podcasts. See you there. Parnell is brought to the Merced County Jail and put in isolated cell block one. This is the same block that Murphy was put into when he's arrested. I couldn't find anything that determined whether or not these two people saw each other. These cell blocks have glass between, so it's possible, um, but they wouldn't be allowed to talk to each other. Parnell is put here because of threats to his life by other inmates. By this time in March, Merced County DA has brought charges of child molestation against him, and those become widely known. Just bringing him into the jail caused inmates to throw things at him, shout obscenities, and threaten his life. Wearing a green sport coat, Parnell shielded his face to the press. He was fingerprinted and photographed. During arraignment, Parnell was brought into court first, and Murphy was brought in after. They're both charged with the same set of crimes. Conspiracy to kidnap, conspiracy to child steal, conspiracy to commit lewd and lascivious acts upon a child and oral copulation. During the hearing, Murphy looks at Parnell once, but they do not talk. We've already gone over most of these crimes, but here the conspiracy conspiracy charges are new. A conspiracy is, according to the SF examiner, and the eventual judge in this case is an agreement between two or more persons to commit a particular crime. Each member of the conspiracy must have a specific intent to commit that crime. The idea being that Parnell and Murphy work together to kidnap a child. And in order for conspiracy charges to stand, one of them also had to commit an overt act. This means something to get ready for the crime. So, And it doesn't have to be both of them, just one of them. So in this case, Parnell renting the cabin having buying toys that were there for when Stephen comes is an overt act. They're, they've made a decision together. They're going into Merced, and the point is to commit this crime, too. What about the religious tracts? Exactly. Was that, That's like an the, overt the act. The ruse is an overt act? Or yeah, no? which makes kind of makes sense now, that because we talked about when the police are looking for those tracks, and we thought it was kind of ridiculous that they would even think they might still be there, but they're hoping to find evidence of that overt act so that they can charge them with conspiracy. So that's premeditation then? Yeah, kind that, of, yeah. That's the same thing as so conspiracy and saying it's a premeditated act are, are linked? Right, but in premeditation, planning for the crime or thinking about the crime can sometimes, sometimes be enough. In this, they can talk together, which Parnell's does. They plan to do it, but they have to actually do something specific to aid in the crime. And that's has to be more overt, essentially. 
Parnell's public defender tells Parnell not to enter a plea because he wants to review the charges and go over them with him. Bell is set at $50,000 and he's sent back to Ukiah. There are many questions on behalf of Parnell's attorney about whether or not the charges can move forward because they are outside the statute of limitations. Ukiah DA Joe Allen tells the press that if charges are dismissed in Merced County, he will be bringing charges against Parnell and Stevens' case. And this is just an example. I mean, we've talked a lot about how these two police departments are kind of at odds because they both want to bring cases. But this is also uh, an example of them working together. By April 1st, Parnell is needed back in Merced for a preliminary hearing. During this hearing, Parnell and Murphy are charged with kidnapping, false imprisonment, molestation, and conspiracy to commit sex offenses. The Merced DA has already dropped child stealing charges. In 1972, the law as written for child stealing won't apply in this case. Some changes to the law were made in 1975 that do make it applicable to the Timothy White case. Again, Murphy and Parnell share a preliminary hearing, and this will continue. They will go to trial together as well. They do have different lawyers. Parnell is assigned a public defender named John Ellery. Murphy is given two court-appointed lawyers. The difference here is a public defender works for the state, and their job is specifically to represent those who can't afford an attorney. And a court-appointed attorney, these are private attorneys who take cases and get paid by the state hourly, but this is not what they normally do. Both Parnell and Murphy enter a plea of not guilty. Ellery asks the court to close the preliminary hearing to the public and the press under the same law that Lestrange used in the Ukiah case. It's granted and the preliminary hearing is closed. At the preliminary hearing, Stephen testifies and it's the first time he sees Parnell since before he escaped. His testimony takes four hours and he's asked a lot of very difficult questions. At least six others testify, including Barbara Mathias, and at the end of the hearing, the defense asks for a dismissal of all the charges based on the statute of limitations running out. The judge asks for each side to submit briefs and says he'll make a decision within the week. The issue here is three basic legal questions. Was there a kidnapping? If there was a kidnapping, did the statute of limitations pass by? And is there actually enough evidence to bring conspiracy to commit sexual abuse charges? So we'll just kind of take those one by one. The first is, was there a kidnapping? So in 1972, when Stephen was kidnapped by Parnell, the kidnapping statute included two kinds of kidnapping. The first is simple kidnapping, which carried an indeterminate sentence of between 1 and 25 years, meaning if a judge found you guilty, he could sentence you to any manner of years between those two, between 1 and 25. And that was dependent solely on the judge making that determination? At first. So... Okay. California, what's confusing part is the 70s in California. A lot of things changed throughout that decade. I think we've made that pretty clear. Yeah. On <laughs> but legally, one of the things that changes that will affect the outcome of this trial is that California switches from indeterminate sentencing to determinate sentencing. So when Stephen is kidnapped, California hands out penalties under the indeterminate sentencing law, which means that a judge will, if you're found guilty, a judge will pick the number of years based on whatever determining factors, and then you go to jail. And when in jail, a new group come in, kind of like what we think a parole board is, a separate board comes in, and they get information on the things you're doing. Because at this time, the real focus is supposed to be rehabilitation. So they, if you are going taking classes, if you are um, a good prisoner, at some point you'll go to this board and they'll reevaluate and reassess and give you perhaps lower amount of years. They can give you a higher. So instead of a parole board coming at the end of a set period of time and saying, yes, you've done what we've asked you to do, we're going to release you on your own recognizance for a set period of time, you're saying that I'm sentencing you to jail time. And then sometime during that jail time, this board will come up and then reevaluate what you've been doing and, and then, then re -ch change, resentence you, resentence you to uh -huh. a new lesser. Could it go the other way and give you longer then too as well? I'm not sure. I don't think that they could give you more than what a judge had already given you. You couldn't, like in this case, a judge would say you're sentenced to one, two, 25 years, and the board couldn't go over that 25 years. Well, a, <laughs> a judge will say he might give you 10 years, let's say, for a crime. So you have one to 25 years, you've kidnapped someone, a judge will, the whole trial happens, he gives you 10 years. So I don't think when this board meets, they can give you over 10 years. They might meet after a year or two and say, you've done everything you need to do, you're obviously being rehabilitated. Maybe we'll give you six more months, then you can get out, or a year, or even you might be good right then. What they can't do is give you another 10 years. Okay. 
So, again, it, it really does function like a parole board. Kind of. Except a parole board, like you said, that's determinate sentencing, which will be what comes in. In 1978, we really change a lot of laws in California. And we pass, people get upset at the system. They feel like people are getting out and committing crimes again. And it's not, people aren't receiving fair justice or punishment. And so we change to a determinate sentencing, which in this case, for Timothy White's case in particular, the law gives the judge the ability to sentence um, three, five, or seven years. Oh, okay. And he has to pick one of those. And then after that's up, a parole board meets and decides whether or not you get out. So on top of sentencing being different, the other thing that simple kidnapping requires is the use of force. The second kind of kidnapping, which was considered the most awful, is aggravated kidnapping. Aggravated kidnapping in 1972 was described as a kidnapping for the purpose of murder or ransom. The kind of kidnapping carried a life sentence in prison or a life sentence without parole, and it could also include the death sentence, depending on the time period in California. California changes a lot with the death penalty through different phases. Stephen's case falls under simple kidnapping because it wasn't for murder or for ransom. According to Parnell's attorney, no actual crime was committed. The simple kidnapping statute in 1980 clearly says that force is required for something to be considered kidnapping. Everybody involved in this case, including Stephen, contends that no actual physical force takes place. So the question becomes one of psychological force, which is often defined by fear. However, Ellerly contends that this was not used either, as in the retelling of the kidnapping by Stephen, he clearly says that he wasn't scared. So the the main question here, the first legal question is really, and it's one that surprised me about this case, because it seems like such an open and shut case, is what is force? And I just, I was surprised to see that in a a kidnapping case of a seven-year-old. It's just hard because I feel like the manipulation should be considered under the term force with this. And that's what the DA will contend. Yeah, I think it's it's clear. (laughs) Stephen was on his way home. And Parnell and Murphy intercepted him, and then he was no longer on his way home. How is that not a clear case of, I took your child? Well, I mean, I guess it's just not. And it it brings up the question for me is, if you pull up and you open your car door and a kid just gets inside and you drive off in 1972, is that not kidnapping? Or would it be? I mean, then it goes, then we've had this conversation before, the difference between that and child stealing. Can seven-year-olds just move? Like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Right. And we've talked about it with Stephen being the kind of child that his parents talked about, always had a respect for adults and would listen to. Parnell lied to Stephen. Right. Repeatedly for days on end. So how is that not some form of force? You're not telling him that it's, you're not saying I'm, I'm going to kidnap you. Yeah. And our current law of kidnapping takes that into account. It very explicitly talks about using fraud to kidnap. But in 1972, it doesn't. So the DA contends that force was used in this case, like you're saying, and that Parnell substituted his own will for that of Stephen. Once Stephen was in the car, Parnell drove past his street, and Stephen pointed out to the men that they were going the wrong direction. If you remember, he believed they were going to ask his mom to make a donation. This moment would be one where Stephen was clearly trying to get the men to turn around, and they refused. His will is overridden by Parnell's. Not much later in the car, Parnell will tell Stephen that he will call his parents to see if he can stay the night, and Stephen suggests that they go to his house to ask his parents directly. They don't, and again, Stephen's own will is broken, and Parnell's put in its place. And this is considered the psychological force you were talking about. But it is interesting and disheartening to think about the consent issues involved here that the da has to make that argument that no steven said no or suggested some alternative to what was happening and that's why this is a kidnapping yeah that it's common sense wouldn't be at the forefront a seven-year-old child in the car of two men one a known raper of children and that doesn't constitute a crime like they're have to they're having to argue the point that it, no no it's a crime but you mentioned consent so even that idea of the did you say like in a rape case did you say no right and if you didn't say no can is that what they call negative consent i don't know exactly what that term means but i think what's important to understand when we're talking about 
all of this is that, and it will continue to be an issue through the trials, is that saying no is not the same thing as giving consent. Um, and that's a really important issue. Saying yes is consent. And not saying no doesn't mean that you wanted something to happen, which I think is interesting in this case because specifically they are presenting evidence that he said no, basically. Right. Stephen did not openly say no, did not resist. He got in the car because he was told to by an adult that from a defense point of view, then it can't be kidnapping. Right. He has to say, I guess, yes, but still because he's so young. But this is where the law is in 1972. And as I said, this will be a big issue continuing through the trial. The second legal question is that if there was a kidnapping, which I think the three of us all agree there was, then the defense argues its statute of limitation has passed. At heart here is what is kidnapping. Ellery argues that it's a singular offense. In 1972, as soon as Parnell's car left Merced and entered Kathy's Valley, the act of kidnapping had ended and the statute of limitations had begun. In 1975, then, those statute of limitations would have expired, and now the DA has no ability, according to Ellery, to bring charges under the law. But the DA and Merced will say that kidnapping is not just a single act. It's an ongoing crime. It started on that day in 1972 and did not end until Stephen walked into the police station in Ukiah in 1980. The clock for the statute of limitations for that crime started on March 2nd, 1980, the day he escaped. So the three years would start then. They both make good points. I mean, I'm definitely on the DA side here, how he was there all because of the psychological force. Right. So he was still kidnapped. But... When laws are written or not written or whatever, it's just so hard to figure out because they're they're lawyers. They're they're trained at making these great descriptions of either way, and it's so hard to figure it out. Well, it's that idea along those lines of keeping something open enough for interpretation, but have it clearly defined that somebody could look at it and say, oh, yes, it is either A— or B, it can't be both. And this is an instance where, I mean, I, I, I'm i on the side, 100% on the DA side. It's it's an act that doesn't but, stop until he leaves. But the defense lawyer makes a good point right. with how the law is written. I mean, they just both make great points, which makes it hard. Yeah, and scary for the Steiner family. Right. Uh, the last question deals with the molestation charges. This is a little simpler, but Ellery contends that during the preliminary hearing, there wasn't concrete evidence presented that molestation took place on the part of Parnell, and Parnell will tell uh, his lawyer and anyone who asks that he did not molest Stephen. The judge in the case decides that kidnapping did occur and that it was an ongoing offense, but he does dismiss all of the molestation charges based on a lack of evidence. And this is not uncommon. According to Rain, out of every 1,000 cases of rape, only 13 cases on average are referred to a prosecutor for trial, and only seven of those on average in a conviction. One of the biggest issues is that a criminal trial requires proof beyond a reasonable doubt. In a case like Stevens, there isn't any physical proof. The last time he says that he was abused was December 1979, just a few months before he escaped from Parnell. And, during, and by this time, there's not actually any bruises or anything like that that anyone can see. And the prosecutor did not find anyone who witnessed the crime of sexual abuse, a not uncommon occurrence for this kind of crime. Thus, the prosecution relies heavily on the strength of the testimony of the person who suffered the abuse. It's difficult to testify about abuse. It's also something Stephen said didn't happen several times before finally talking with police. Again, not something that's unusual for people who are victims. And he hasn't really had a chance even to process most of the stuff for himself. So there are a lot of obstacles for him to sit and testify to these things. Though none of those obstacles appear to be a lack of belief on the part of Merced Police and the district attorney. And here's the thing about these charges. These are not charges that Parnell will stand trial for. And understandably, this makes people very angry. It makes us very angry. But I've done a lot of research into this. And when I first started doing research, what I saw was police being asked why they never brought charges some of the police were in um ukiah some of them were in merced and i don't i don't know that those were later articles so i don't know why they answer the way they do they make it seem like they didn't want to put steven through it 
And that's kind of the story I've heard most often. But when I did this day-to-day through the trial, what I saw is that the Merced DA and the Merced police try to bring charges, these charges specifically, against Parnell several times. They get dismissed, as they do up front here, and then a couple weeks later, the DA will bring them again. They're very interested in trying to find justice for what happened to Stephen, and specifically for what Parnell did to him when it comes to the sex crimes. And it's very frustrating, but these charges, they don't stick uh, due to a lack of evidence. But it just I just wanted to set the record straight a little here that it does not seem to be because police don't want to bring them or because police don't believe Stephen, which you do often hear in cases like this, that someone didn't believe you or didn't think your information was enough. It seems like in what we talked about, most of the police, if not all of them, believe Stephen almost from day one, right? Yeah. And that's not to say that concern over someone testifying, a victim testifying, doesn't exist. According to Rain, choosing whether or not to come forward and talk about abuse or rape is a difficult one for each victim. And some people will want to come forward and some will want to not, not go through it. So each victim has their own journey. After the judge rules in the preliminary hearing that the kidnapping charges can stand, the defense appeals the ruling and eventually the first district court of appeals in California will take the case. This process will take almost a year to play out and for hearings to be had in this case. The first district will agree unanimously with the Superior Court judge and uphold both the charge of kidnapping and the statute of limitations. They agree with the prosecution and cite all the examples we've already talked about. They also say that it doesn't really make much sense that if someone kidnaps someone and then lets them go, they would be subject to a trial, but if they were to keep that person just longer, they would go free. During the hearings at the Court of Appeals, the California Attorney General, who is arguing the case, will for the first time tell the court that the motive in Parnell's case is, quote, looking for a young person to satisfy his sexual desire. This will be the first time this is really shared in a courtroom. He will also say the defense's claim, and this does become part of Parnell's defense, that he wanted to build a family, was not backed up by evidence. The California Attorney General has filed a brief which cites 53 other kidnapping cases with similar circumstances in which the law was interpreted as the prosecution believes it exists. The appeals court also throws out the conspiracy to commit sexual offenses due to a lack of evidence. The defense will appeal to the California Supreme Court, and this will also take months. During this time, Stephen Stainer is trying to get his life back together. His mother, Kay Stainer, will tell the paper that if the court were to side with the defense, they would move on with their lives in some ways, that this might even be easier than if they decide to side with the prosecution. She also says Stephen hasn't talked with either of his parents about the abuse he suffered, so she's worried about what she's going to have to hear during the trial and also worried about what happens to Stephen when it's printed in the newspaper. I can kind of understand where Kay's coming from because... Stephen doesn't really know her, and so he he's not going to really open up. It is his mother, but he hasn't seen her for seven years. Those developmental stages, he probably doesn't feel like he can talk to his mother or is very open. So she's going to have to hear it in the newspaper, and it's going to be horrible. Yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff happening. You have to process both the fact that you were kidnapped— and this is a, a second time in his life where he has to, he's already, he grew up for seven years, then he had to become another person entirely, be called Dennis, then he comes home and now he's Steven again. And just processing that alone would be difficult. And now he has to deal with the trials and then also with people talking about the sexual abuse that he suffered and him being asked about it in court. And I don't, based on everything I read, he doesn't really open up about these charges ever to really anyone. It's not something he talks about uh, with friends or anything like that, but... I understand what you're saying. It's like a Stephen's using that as a coping mechanism. I would imagine that if I don't talk about it, if we don't discuss it, if I don't bring it up to my mom, and then it's not real. I can, I can hide away from it. Like even Kay saying, move on. We can go on with our lives. But now that it's in the court record and it's said, it's now... Um, it's public record. It's real. And now having to confront that is devast- It's Again, we've talked a lot about that throughout the series, and we always come back to it. But it's another instance of Stephen being raked over the coals and victimized all over again. Except in this, this time, much like before in the newspaper, it's public. And his family at this time, they don't know more than if he's not speaking with them. They don't know more than we know than what I can tell you happened to him. They know that charges have been brought, so they know that it happened. But past that, 
Sitting in a courtroom and hearing the details will be a whole different thing, hearing what happened to him over those seven years. And also in all our research into victims of abuse, that thing where you block it out or don't want to talk about is very common. And it's not wrong. People have to survive and they do whatever that takes. For some people, it will be going to trial and telling someone and you know, yelling at the world about it. For some people, we'll be never bringing it up. And there are lots of people who keep that to themselves and spend their whole lives never speaking about it. And all of those things are okay and not uncommon. And it's, it, it's, it, I imagine, again, and then it puts, a, it puts the court in a difficult position because on one hand, I, I see the court's job as protecting the victim. But then to bring the guilty party to justice, we have to hurt the victim all over again. Well, it's difficult because it's not necessarily the court's job to do that. It's the prosecution's job to bring these charges and to to fight for them. But the court's job is to, as a court, protect the right of the innocent. You're right. And so that makes it, I think, difficult because we focus, as we should in this podcast, about from the perspective of Stephen or Timothy and their victims and the families and their victims. But going through this process should be said is really difficult for for everyone because it's just a whole different level of things eventually the california supreme court will decline to take the case and let the opinion of the first district court of appeals stand and this will happen in august 1981 so almost a year later so we will end here on this episode next episode we will begin with the trial of kenneth parnell in the kidnapping of timothy white our cold case for tonight is a missing persons case from Merced, California, and the information came from the California Attorney General's Office and the Merced Sun Star. Irma Linda Alvarado of Merced was reported missing on April 11, 2019, when she failed to pick up her husband from the Fresno International Airport as previously planned. The last time her husband, Jose Alvarado, saw Irma Linda was on April 8th, and the last time they talked was on April 10th. It was reported that Ermelinda Alvarado's rental car was found on April 11th abandoned on Highway 10 near Blythe, California, a short distance from the Arizona border. California Highway Patrol reports that the car was found closer to Indio, California. Inside the car was her purse, including her ID. Her cell phone was not been found. At the time, she was driving a red Hyundai Elantra. Ermelinda Alvarado is described as a 33-year-old Hispanic woman with brown eyes and dark brown shoulder-length hair. She has braces and is 5 feet 6 inches tall and 110 pounds. The last time she was seen, she was wearing a black hoodie, black pants, and running shoes. She is a mother of eight children, and her family is looking for any information into her disappearance. You can find more information on the Facebook page, Missing Irma Alvarado, at help find Irma Linda Alvarado. If you have any information about the disappearance of Irma Linda Alvarado, please call the Merced Police Department at area code 209-385-6912. Thank you for listening to this episode of California True Crime. If you'd like to ask us any questions, you can contact us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at Cali True Crime. You can also email us at CaliTrueCrime at gmail.com. Uh, if you would like to help support us, uh, you can go to our Patreon page and make a donation. We'd like to thank our quality control human who listens to things, Melanie Duncan. This has been a production of Chateau Walnut.